Is it recording? Action! Welcome in here today. No, I gotta start over again. <laughs> Dude, they're gonna get out of the <laughs> yeah, car. No, we're gonna go talk to them. <laughs> I can't be right. Because I just put a new battery in. Here today with Phoenix Sanders. He is my uh, future son-in-law. Getting married in a couple of weeks. But um, Phoenix is a pitcher in the Tampa Bay Rays organization. 10th round draft pick. Um, has ascended rather quickly in an organization that's full of pitchers. I mean, it's number one pitching organization in baseball. But would have been three years, really two full seasons. He's about made it to AAA and has had a lot of success. Um, I think the story of Phoenix is that he's had success all along the way, but no one has ever really been wanting to give him much of a shot because Phoenix is 5'10", 5'11". People don't think that he's going to be doing much out of the mound, but he gets out there and deals, right? So yeah, I remember when, um, when Haley told me, my daughter told me that she was uh, dating a baseball player. I was like, oh, cool, and, and uh, couldn't wait to meet you. And then we went and picked Phoenix up. They were, you guys were like 15 then. And Phoenix got in the car, and I was like, is this the baseball player? Because he was like 130 pounds at the time, right? But full of confidence, and you, and you played for one of the best travel teams around. You did. And um, you were getting guys out then. Yeah. So the thing about Phoenix is, is that he went to a junior college, the Daytona State, after his, his senior year, which um, we'll talk about your success there in a, in a little bit. But uh, they went to Daytona State and then became the Friday night guy there for two years. And then went to University of South Florida and became the Friday night guy there for two years. Then drafted in the 10th round by the, by the Rays. And a few years later here, he's knocking on the door to get to the big leagues. And it's, it's, it's amazing. This guy has never been handed anything and he's had to work for all of it. He doesn't light you up when you, when you look at him. He's not the six foot four guy and all that. And it's just amazing. Uh, I think he pitches with a chip on his shoulder and, um, Tell us how you came about being the type of pitcher that you are today. Did it develop more in high school or when you got to college? I think it's developed since I was younger. Honestly, I've always been ultra competitive. So that's always been kind of the thing with me. And I hung out, always played up. So everybody I hung out with or practiced with and played basketball, manhunt, anything, everybody's always older. So if you're going to compete with that, you either got to buck up and do it or you're going to get kind of left behind. You know, my neighbor was two years older than me, so always hung out with him, threw with him. So when I was 10, he was 12, and we would he'd bring over his buddies. We'd play wiffle ball or whatever it was, and I was, again, too competitive not to compete. And kind of I think that was instilled in me. And then in high school, being the new kid and nobody knowing who was who and really had to show, like, yeah. I'm from Orlando, and baseball was different in Orlando, bigger area, probably better competition and everything. And in, even my first, again, I had to play freshman baseball, JV baseball, then two years of varsity, when I probably should have played three years of varsity, one years of JV, but didn't. But instead of sulking and being pissed about it, just kind of went along my business. And again, everything kind of worked out. So I, again, had nothing to really complain about. Everything kind of happens for reasons that you don't know. So again, I just always control what you can control, because if you worry about all the other stuff, you're just going to beat yourself up over time. I noticed that when you, um, ever since I've known you and watching your pitch, and that's since high school, that uh, you work very quickly. Yep. Is there, what's the, what's, what's the reasoning behind that? Um, honestly, it's just always been, if you're going to be good, be good quickly. And if you're going to suck, do it quickly. Because nobody likes sitting out there staring at the stars or staring at the sun when somebody's out there sucking. So at least we keep people involved. And it's just a rhythm thing. I think baseball is a very rhythm, momentum kind of game so if you can stay consistent with your momentum either good or bad I think again I've always had from guys playing behind me to the ground screw always kind of like the days I threw because we were in and out of there in two and a half hours then three and a half hours so just little indirect things and direct things that make everything better um I, his curveball is is one of his is probably has got to be his best pitch he has uh a high spin rate on his fastball, which gives the illusion of his fastball actually rising, which is why he can pitch at the top of the zone 
and throw less than 95 miles an hour. Right. Right. It's um, and then his curveball has also the exceptional rate on the other side, you know, going downward. So how did you develop that that breaking ball? Honestly, it was. It's a, I think it's just. I've always been able to manipulate the ball well because I was not allowed to throw a curveball until I was 15. So it was fastball change up. So you just kind of learned how to spin it up, spin it down, spin it away. And then when I started learning actually how to throw a curveball and kind of just practice it, I was pretty rigorous about throwing flock rounds, bullpens where I throw 12 in a row, 10 in a row until I found the shape, the grip, everything that kind of fit. Where I think now people just. And curveballs are hard to throw. That's why I think everybody goes to the slider because it's a you can throw it hard like a fastball. And you can just tilt the ball and throw it as hard as you can. Where break with curveballs, you kind of have to understand how to spin it, how to spin it out of your hand, where you want to spin it out of your hand. And I think I was just blessed with the ability to spin the ball because I was always fastball, curveball in junior college. I didn't start throwing a slider really until I got to USF. And the slider works against. You said against every hitter I've ever faced from how my junior year at USF till now. And so I've really only been throwing that four or five years, ultra competitive. So, Do you find it hard to throw both the slider and the curve? And does, the, does, does the arm get confused? Does the grip or slot get confusing? Um, I wouldn't say I get confused, but there's definitely days where the curveball usually is there eight, nine out of ten times. The slider, there are some days where I have to throw more of them to kind of get it going. And I think that's just, again, I've thrown the curveball now 10 years and the slider 6. So there's still four more years of improvement. And I think that's been the big difference is every year I've gotten better. Yeah, throw a little bit harder. Stuff's gotten a little bit more crisp. But it's like each year this stuff's just making a little bit of a jump. And that's just, again, throwing flat grounds where you throw 10 straight sliders until the one you like. And then you throw that slider 10 more times. And you just teach your brain. That's what you need to kind of throw and how to do it. I'll just say that coming out of coming out of college, we used to talk about in college. You guys threw down in the zone yep. so much, right? And and uh, and now you're throwing up in the zone a ton. Yep. Right. You had to you had to change up going there for a while. You're not really using that much more any, anymore, are you? No. It's a. I'm trying to use it more now, just to not be a predictable fastball curveball to lefties. At least have something to show. It's just a matter of, we've talked about it, like if I throw a first pitch change up and I give up a home run off of it, I just do my fourth best pitch when I'm only going to throw maybe two innings. So it's kind of like you weigh out your options, you have your game plan with your catcher and your pitching coach, and maybe if it's a a day after you've thrown, like a, a outing where you, again, you've thrown well for a while and you know, okay, hey, I'm going to make sure I throw right. five change ups today. And it's also hard, It's a, that's the whole idea of, development in the minor leagues you can say hey coach i want to throw more change up my next three outings and see how it is and that's the maturity aspect of professional baseball compared to amateur baseball i remember you used to say if you're going to get beat don't get beat with your third pitch exactly get beat with your best one and they get in you tip your cap and say hey you got me today yeah it's a good way good, good thing to live by with that huh? i'm sure so when you um when you when you got out of college and got into pro ball what were your expectations and how has pro ball worked out compared to what you thought it was going to be like to uh, where you're at now? Yeah, pro ball has definitely been a roller coaster in the sense of I'm a pretty free spirited, doesn't look like I care until like the game and the lights kind of turn on. And I had a, when I first got in, I sucked. Like I, I had this perception that I needed to be serious. You couldn't laugh. You kind of had to go about it as a work. And until I got comfortable and understood, no, it's just baseball. There's just, different you're just playing everybody's best guy my era went from like a seven to like a four in a very short time because again it was short season it was two and a half months you could go six shutty and then give up three runs and your ERA is a three or you give up six shutty and then you give up six runs now it's six so it's just kind of like you had to understand kind of what you needed to do and I was still starting in rookie ball and I remember going to spring training and they were like what do you want to do and I was like whatever gets me to low a and at that point, it was being a reliever. And then ever since then, I've been between an inning and a three-inning guy. And each level I've gone up, it's kind of like you need to make a jump. You need to make a jump. And I think it really hit me when I went to the fall league in 18 that I needed to make a jump because I could get away with fastball, curveball, and low A, high A. But when you're facing the Vlad Guerrero Juniors, the Pete Alonzos, the Keston Heras, you got to have three different pitches that 
you got to at least show you can throw three so they have to honor right. all three because those guys that are in the big leagues at 22, 23 years old can hit fastballs and they usually hit one breaking ball. And if they can sell 50-50, they're going to eventually get you as kind of the time goes yeah. on. These guys don't realize that you know you don't leave a pitch off the table, right? If you have a pitch, you keep throwing it. Yep. Throw it in times that you can't get hurt, right? Yep. And then So at least they know that they have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always remember it was trying to get guys to slider speed bat. Yep. Right? If you can get guys who have just incredible bat speed and you throw them enough breaking stuff, you're going to slow it down, and then you can actually beat them with the fastball, right? And For then sure. Throw them enough breaking, uh, enough fastballs. Guys who have subpar bat speed will catch up. Yep. Right. So it's all about kind of having that mix. I mean, unless, of course, you probably throw a hundred. Yeah, you just get away with different stuff. But uh, so you found a third pitch. So you, you yeah, you really have committed to throwing both breaking balls, especially now throwing the slider to lefties. I never threw sliders to lefties because it was always if you're gonna if you miss, it usually misses middle into their swing path. Or if you miss to a righty with a slider, it's like okay. It's still going away from their bat. For now, it's kind of getting confidence to either throw it up and in as like a cutter node, like a dead zone, or really burying it back foot. Because if you miss, that's where you kind of get hurt. Yeah. But that's also, you have to play that game. Like You have to play the that fine line of, in high school, you can get away with just a curveball middle because it's better than the kid. And even in junior college, and then like, you get to junior college in USF, it's like there was three or four guys that could hurt you. When you're in pro ball, it's all nine guys. Can, at least seven are going to hurt you, especially when you get to double-A, triple-A. You're going to have nine guys that at least can hit the ball out of the ballpark. So when you make mistakes, the really good ones don't miss them very so often. One of, the, one of the things I think that you've done well and that, that I think some guys at every level um, shy away from is throwing, getting ahead. Yeah. They throw away from contact so much, right? Yep. And it's... Then I don't care who you are. You better start bringing cheese. Yeah. I mean, you better you better get ahead because if you're going 2-0 to a Vlad Junior. Yeah. He's uh, he can get ugly with the size of swings the swings he's going to be taking on you now, right? So you got to get ahead. How, what's your plan on getting ahead? How do you how do you work? Well, that's the thing. You got to have a good game plan with your catcher and your pitching coach. Like me, I'm a breaking ball guy, so I understand. I've got to throw fastballs in counts that either they're not like if I go 2-0. I either have to throw a 2-0 slider or a 2-0 heater. And usually when you get to higher levels, they're going to sell out one of them. That's why you see these guys on TV hit 2-0 sliders meaning, meaning, out. Yeah, meaning they're going to look They're going to look for one of them. So you've got to either make a – got to throw it where they're not looking or hope to hit it at somebody. So there's times to where when you get ahead, if it's with 0-0 breaking balls, heaters, change-ups, whatever, you've got to just commit to throwing it middle. And, again, you teach hitting and you teach – kind of like a funnel in different zones. So if I throw first pitch breaking ball and it leaves that tunnel and then comes back at the end, like your hitter shouldn't swing at it anyway, unless you're sitting it. And if you're sitting it, then you tip your cap and you say, well, good for you. But it's like if you commit to throwing the ball middle, middle down, middle up, it's like sliders go left. So if I commit to middle down and it's left, it's out of third. Or if I throw a change up middle down, it goes inner third because it's got arm side. Or if I throw fastball middle up, if it's up, I got a chance for a fly ball, also more chances for home runs. So it's just kind of like if you legitimately work middle, pitches are naturally going to move. If, if everybody could throw the ball exactly where they wanted it, pitching would be a lot easier. It's hard to throw a ball on a 17-inch plate because you got to account for movement that sometimes they move different each time. So legitimately, that's what the Rays teach us is just middle. When you see the big hitters come up there, does it make it make it tougher for you to throw a strike, or you're just coming at them no matter what? And do you see when you see guys who struggled over your over your time in college, like that, is that, are those guys trying to feel for the strike zone? They're they're throwing away from they don't want to get whacked, so they they play it too safe, right? And they yeah. they throw the ball on the fringe just too much, like we were talking about, instead of going after the guy, and the ball's going to ride. And, and, and well, I think guys. It's okay to strike out because they want you hitting home runs. So guys now almost think it's okay to walk guys if you strike guys out. So guys are okay to walk guys now, whereas if your stuff is good enough, you will beat the hitter as bad as it sounds. Like hitting's hard too. Like you think about it, if you get the best hitters in the big leagues get 200 hits a year, and let's say they see whatever it is, 5,000 pitches, 4,000 pitches, just don't be one of the 200 hits. So if you can dumb it down to where if I pitch, throw 15 pitches and I throw <clears throat> 10 pitches exactly where I want it and then five quality ones, 
you're probably going to have success. And I think that really stems from working the ball middle and allowing it to move six inches one way instead of trying to throw the ball on the black and then you miss two inches. Now you go two o heater and the guy hits the ball to the middle. So it's right. you got to just as bad as sound dumb it down. Yeah, and this goes for catchers out there, right? You catchers. God, I go to games and you guys are giving signs and and they move right to the corners, right? First guy, they're sitting on the black. So if you miss, if that guy misses just outside of your glove, it's a ball you're falling behind all day. Pitchers need to learn that, right? That yeah. right there. you got to get ahead. Walking guys and falling behind is not a good way to work. Your defense falls asleep. Um, and guys who walk, a lot of people don't pitch for very long. It's yeah. just, that's just the way it works. We've got to be getting ahead, right? And you got to be able to find a pitch that can get you there. So that so that get me over that get over slider really kind of helped you in college. Yeah. You could throw it early in the count, right? And get your strike. And the hard part is, is making that differentiation sometimes from you get me over slider to a uh, slider down in the dirt or out of the strike zone or the fastball zone. So what I see when, with young players is a lot of them throw that two-strike breaking ball for a strike. They want to throw it for a strike. Yeah. And, it, and it gets hammered because yeah. they're up in the zone. How do you, um, how would you teach or how would you tell a young player to, to be able to pitch with two strikes? Or Well, that's like a thing that I do with my lessons and I teach kids is like I look for pitches that have better movement and then we'll figure out how to get them in the zone. That was my big thing when I got to throwing the curveball. I struggled where I would throw the really good one that would hit off home plate and guys wouldn't swing at it. They would swing at it, but then I'd throw it 1-1 and they would take it because, again, if I throw a good one and you're, even if you're sitting it, you're probably not going to hit it. You might hit it, but you're not going to hit, hit it as well as they would think. So the idea is to learn how can I throw the really good one in the zone. So yeah, I think I try to teach, learn how to throw the really good one in your bullpens and then learn, okay, if I know for me to throw one for a strike, I start at the top of the mask. To throw one off home plate, I start at the bottom of the mask. It's a six inch difference. It's like that's where, again, with maturity and time, you learn the shape of your pitches. And I think that's the hardest part about younger kids is inconsistency with all of their pitches they throw really really good oh, yeah. slider backup slider okay slider when you're like okay what did you do would you feel different on all three and they tell you i don't know or they or to, to add to that they have five pitches that too right they all have the curveball change up they throw, uh, all of them like to throw in the okay change next thing you know they have six pitches and none of them are really really good how about i always think can we control the fastball first yep and then we can work from there. That I was fastball change up till high school. I think I threw a curveball when I was twelve because I was stronger at that point. As soon as point. you started throwing that curve, it took the change up yeah, out. Yeah, took the change was up right curve, out. Was your curve yeah. nasty right out of the chute? Yeah, it was good right away. And I think that's where actually my junior college pitching coach told me that. I think I went to a camp and I was eighty two, eighty four, maybe touching eighty five as a senior at this camp. And he was like, I offered you a scholarship because I saw you could spin the ball and you just manipulated a curveball like I hadn't seen before. And then got there as a freshman, it was like 84, 86, touching 87, 88. Actually came and lived with you, put on like 30 pounds. And we went, actually pitched in the Northwoods. That was the first time I ever hit 90. And yeah. And I remember that. I remember getting up there and they were kind of like, hey, how hard do you throw? I'm like 85, 86, and they were like, all right. And I remember the first three pitches I threw were 89, 90, 91. I came back in there like, why'd you have to lie to us? I was like, I was, oh, we were I, watching you. We were watching you on the on the whatever the, the feed, right? Yep. And you hit 90, and we saw it on the cover. Like, yeah, there it is. Yep, that was that was interesting. It also helps that I was 18. I just turned 19, so I was supposed to. I technically should have been a freshman instead of being a sophomore. So that was also probably my body catching up maturity-wise because I was 17 when I graduated high school, 20. I turned, I was 21 when I graduated college and turned 22 five days before the draft, where most guys were 21 that were juniors and I was a 21-year-old senior. So the whole, it just, again, never really, I always played up and through college and through everything. Yeah, I was in the same boat. It's tough. It's amazing how much... A year or two at that time. Oh, for sure. It, it makes a big difference. Throwing fastballs inside, being able to pitch inside. What is your theory on that? How do you go about it for yourself? Well, that's the thing. I think, um, again, what the Rays have done well is they tell you not to be so fine with throwing it in. Like, throwing the ball in the corners is really hard. So instead of thinking about throwing it on the block, throw it on the inner third, and then understand when you, can, when you need to miss in. 
Like there's plenty of pitchers you can watch in the big leagues that you move the guy's feet just to open up everything. Because if you can't move the feet and that guy knows you're not going to throw in consistently, or at least there's not a, there's not a chance. And again, I'm a strike thrower, so there's a, the most guys are going to go. This guy's not going to hit me. So if I do throw the ball in, they know it's not going to hit me. Sometimes you do have to throw all two balls in just to move their feet to where yes. they can the, the dugout and every the guy on deck can look at it and go, wow, he maybe he's a little more wild today than normal or guys, something, if, or you, something. For you guys out there listening to this, and that the part about moving his feet is is huge. That's been around for so long. You don't hear that at lower levels in high school and things like. That. You get into professional sports with guys that can pitch and have talked about pitching for a long time. Moving their feet is crowding them enough that's a breaking ball down at their feet also to get them to Anything move to them. legitimately make them move. Like, it, like it, just think about if you – I've heard this from Dick Bosman, who was our pitching coordinator. So just imagine that if somebody threw every outing and he hit one person every outing, and the guy was at six innings and he hadn't, get, hadn't hit anybody yet, you know those three guys hitting that inning go, well, he hasn't hit somebody yet. It's just thoughts in your head, just little funny things like that where it's yes. like – you don't ever throw at anybody on purpose, but you throw a ball in and make them legitimately run out of the batter's box. That guy on deck's going to go, Jesus, he just threw two balls in at that guy's hip. That's 92 in. It doesn't feel good. And again, like Scott's saying, like legitimately we're trying to move their feet. But you get into amateur baseball and it's just throw the ball down and away, down and away, down and away. Because the average high school 12-year-old can't hit balls down and away. They just can't do it. It's, it's, it's a hard pitch to hit. And in pro ball, they'll start to lean out over the plate. I remember um, the late Bob Gibson uh, asked him that same question years and years ago, and he, and he said that he, and he was known kind of as a headhunter, and he said he was not that way at all. He, he just knew that guys are diving, guys are getting out over the plate and taking big rips at him, and he, you, you can't allow guys to be taking the swings at you like that. So you'd come in, and a lot of times guys are leaning so far into the plate trying to take big rips that you would – You'd hit him. Yep. But it's so you're 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 thinking now when you were younger you could you had a good control out there and you could get guys out just sitting out there. Yeah. Was it a, was it much of a change? Was it harder for you to start working the ball in more? Yeah. Like I can honestly say I still struggle now with it because you get to points where again as you get older it ends up being a chess game. Like you understand it. Um, if a guy's still in 98 and has a really good breaking ball, you can't go up. There's none of this sit fast while react breaking ball. You have to give yourself a chance and just be like, well, he throws sliders 65% of the time with two strikes. Let's see if he's going to throw something away and hope that it's that. So throwing the ball in doesn't have to, again, doesn't have to be in for a strike. It just has to be in to where you can just, at least they know it's kind of in the inner half. And yeah, I struggled with it in the sense of, again, from eight years old to, 21, it was throw the ball down and away, throw the ball down and away, throw the ball down and away. What did, you, what did you do mechanically or mentally to be able to get the ball in there and not drill the guy? Because I know guys start to come off the ball, yeah. especially throwing into a righty, and that when you come off the ball, it gets even worse. For sure. Right. So how did you make that adjustment? Well, pitching is a lot with your eyes. So legitimately just feeling like your right eye goes to where you want the ball to go. So it's just legitimately visual points on, okay, and again, it comes from flat ground work and playing catch with your partner to where it's not a hand side miss. It's a, I'm driving this ball through the inside corner. So my eyes and you would say really feeling your hand getting kind of where you want the ball to go and not over exaggerate. Like you said, don't pull your front side. You kind of have to, everything stays the same. You just make a visual cue and kind of a hand placement cue on how to get the ball from, again, it's only 17 inches. So you can't really make anything drastic. I don't think it was ever, my foot goes this way. My hips don't change. It's legitimately my eyes and my hand that kind of get the ball right. where so I want it. I think some guys think about, oh, I'm going to hit that guy, and then they hit the guy. Exactly. Instead of, you don't think about that when you're executing a, a fastball away, right? Yep. So just think about executing the pitch, and you kind of keep the batter out of your out of your head at that point. Yeah. Again, you've got to understand. That's the whole point of guys that throw great bullpens. Like again, we do lessons. Guys hit an amazing BP with you, or throw a great bullpen with me, and they go. Oh, for three or three craze and walk three guys and their parents are like what the heck it's like well there's an element of like you've got to do that's why you try to do your structure bullpens flat grounds with high game intensity so you don't have that lag of oh there's a hitter there now now i'm scared now you're now you're talking i pitch with way too many guys and catch work out with guys 
who throw pens and their intensity time after time it's just not there yeah. and i mean even if you're not rocking and rolling breaking out your nastiest stuff ever the intensity has to be there you have to mimic that all the time don't For you sure absolutely i think i i've noticed that from you you always when you get on there to throw your pen or whenever you're, your business you yep. know and like you know as a hitter you want to be able to do that too right capture that same essence of what you how else are you going to perform i mean you have to be in a an actor, I would guess, you know, has to get into acting mode yeah. and perform when he's even when he's just rehearsing, right? For sure. So um, I would think that's a big key too. But hey, we'll be talking more. I uh, want to thank you again, Phoenix, for yeah. wrapping with us. Thanks and, for uh, having me, for sure. And uh, check out Phoenix; he's going to be on the big screen here soon. And uh, we'll be talking to you real soon.